Well, we will get started. Uh, thank you all for joining. My name is Joey Clark, and I am the program manager for the STARTS program uh, through INSEN, uh, the National Security Innovation Network. The STARTS program aims to help uh, military leaders and divisions solve problems through early stage ventures and also uh, other aspects of the ecosystem, such as venture capital, um, academia in some instances. But we are working with the advance, uh, with the um, with the FOA on eTextiles and hopefully having a STARTS event in late July. So this AMA session is aimed at helping you ask your questions before the pre-proposal deadline of June 13th. And we have some wonderful experts in SMEs here who are going to help you clarify their positions, uh, some of the subject matter, uh, subject matter uh, uh, pieces of the pre-proposal, and also even some logistical aspects of it. So uh, right now, I want to also uh, introduce um, some people who we have on the call, especially my colleague, Matt Meridi, who is our uh, Northeast Regional Director at Incent, and maybe he can uh, give his uh, give a hi and and uh, give a little bit about his his role. Hey everyone, really appreciate you all uh, taking the time to be uh, be a part of this uh, AMA. Uh, very excited. This is uh, for everyone's situational awareness. Uh, this is something that we've been talking about at least generally about uh, trying to do this kind of a collaboration for the better part of a year or longer. Um, so it's almost as old as COVID. Uh, this idea. So it's glad glad to finally seeing it getting to fruition, and very excited to see. Uh, what the feedback is going to be on topic five for the uh, ongoing project call over at AFOA. So just first off, thank you very much for coming. Uh, so I'm Ensign's New England person. You may notice my name is not Jeff Pekuska, but mm -hmm. that is because uh, Jeff is going to be on camera in a moment. We're actually in the same place uh, for the first time, I think, in our uh, year and a half of working together. Um, so it's exciting times, and this is a great time now to be talking about the types of collaborations that we're going to be seeing coming out of this project call and for the projects that you all are going to be proposing. So uh, I will yield the floor to people far smarter and more knowledgeable than I about uh, all this process, uh, but just wanted to say that, again, thank you for your time. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing the proposals that you come up with, and we hope that this is a good opportunity to uh, not just learn a bit more about the project call itself, but really get into some more of the nuances about how to tailor your great ideas uh, so that they can be usable by the uh, textiles community and specifically by the Department of Defense. So looking forward to hearing uh, your questions and comments and uh, everyone else over to you. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. I know that was coming back to me, so I'm, I don't know if you were intending those good words for me, but um, I appreciate it. So I'll give some, uh, some more overview before we get started. Uh, this is very much an informal conversation. So the audience is the one who's going to be driving this. I know Jesse has some, has some notes and things that we want to kind of talk about. But um, as I mentioned, this is being recorded uh, for future reference. And then also we will be taking questions through the uh, chat and Q&A function. If you look down on the bottom of your uh, control panel through the Zoom, uh, you will see the Q&A and chat function. So uh, right now I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to introduce himself. Uh, the team that he's with, and then also I think he has some thoughts that he wants to kind of lay out. And then um, if you want to start queuing up your questions too, if you have them, if you have them and you want to start right now, we'll be taking them in order as we get them. And uh, we'll make sure to, to try to use as much of the time as possible. So uh, over to you, Jesse, for introductions and, uh, and for any presentation materials you have. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joey. So I, I was just uh, starting to share my screen and um, let's see, I need to allow for all panelists here to share. Okay, hold on a sec. Um, so yeah, uh, looking forward to a good conversation today, everyone. Um, my name is Jess Jor. I'm a, uh, uh, the Director of uh, Ecosystem Technology here at AFOA. Um, we are uh, really excited about this project call 2.0. Um, in which one of the topics 2.5, we're working with uh, Ensign on uh, developing a, uh, a develop or helping startup companies uh, work on dual purpose technologies for both uh, obviously commercial use and DOD use. Um, a quick, uh, quick couple notes. Uh, first of all, um, are the this is a two stage proposal call. Um, the first stage is a pre proposal that's due June 13th, uh, and then the selected. Uh, companies uh, from that pre-proposal round will end up going towards a final round that will participate in a incense starts event uh, that's going to be hosted on July 29th. Um, from a budgeting standpoint, uh, we do have a uh, uh, there is a a, a total award amount of four hundred fifty thousand dollars on this, um, which we're expecting three um, 
uh, three awardees from that. Um, and of course, uh, the you'll be able to work with the FO ecosystem, which Michelle is going to talk to you all about uh, here in just a moment. Um, so anyways, I'm here today to uh, kind of be the panelist or be the not a panelist, but the uh, the moderator for a panel, uh, which includes Michelle Farrington, uh, who's the VP of strategy uh, here at AFOA, uh, Jeff Pekuska, who is a program manager uh, at DEFCOM uh, in future integrations as well as Jordan Schindler, who is the CEO of New Fabrics and was also a uh, recipient of our project called 1.0, um, uh, uh, yeah, a recipient from our project 1.0 funding. Um, and he's got good stories to tell about uh, interacting with AFOA um, and some of the technology developments that you can provide. So without further ado, y'all don't wanna hear me talk, you'd rather hear everyone else. So I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle to uh, start to kick us off. Michelle, go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen just one second. All right, so I thought what I'd do is talk to you a little bit about what, a, for those of you that are not familiar with the FOA, talk to you a little bit about a FOA and the institutes, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and, and we'll certainly uh, address them as we, get a, we, we come across them. So just to provide some background, the institutes were st uh, stood up, this Manufacturing USA uh, program was stood up as a public-private partnership to expressly improve the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing. So this were, uh, there were a total of over a billion dollars of, of combined investments, including uh, institutes that, that were funded by the DOD, of which AFOA is one of nine institutes. And there are sort of obviously many advantages to our having a robust um, domestic manufacturing ecosystem. We can, and so AFOA plays a part in accelerating innovation, we can also increase customization, reduce time to market, and then also have positive effects on the environment as well as national security. Just to give you an idea of some of the other institutes that are uh, DOD funded, NextFlex is another institute that is uh, focused on flexible hybrid electronics. Uh, ARM in particular is focused on advanced robotics for manufacturing. And those are two institutes that we do uh, quite a bit of, of uh, collaborative work with um, here at AFOA. Just to speak specifically about AFOA, our mission is to, is to rekindle the domestic textile industry. And the idea is to provide a nationwide enterprise for advanced functional fibers and fabrics. So in other words, putting new technology into the ecosystem to revive an aging industry. So our, our, uh, we have three roles in order to fulfill that. The first role is to develop uh, new technologies both at AFOA headquarters and through our fabric discovery centers, as well as through our ecosystem by providing funds to the ecosystem. And that's what Project Hall 2.0 is all about. In addition, we are establishing a, an all new ecosystem around advanced functional fibers and fabrics. And so you'll see in a few minutes as part of our ecosystem, we have members spanning from traditional textiles advanced, to advanced materials to even semiconductor companies as we bridge the these two industries together. And then lastly, we also have an education and workforce development function where we are providing training and new capabilities in the EWD space for this new industry. So AFOA stands at the intersection of two industries, as we talked about the electronics industry, so semiconductors and, and software and, and um, engineering integration, as well as the traditional textile industry, where which consists of uh, all the way back at the fiber level, all the way through uh, knitting, weaving, uh, non-wovens and, and product assembly. And so AFOA is joining that ecosystem with a robust network of um, industry, academic and government partners and doing things like solving technical problems and, and working on technology innovation as well as doing active matchmaking and teaming across the ecosystem. 
we focus on MRLs, technologies that are in the space of MRL four to seven, and trying to actually br bring technologies through that valley of death through our funding and through our internal work such that we can um, effectively stimulate rapid transition between university funded efforts as well as um, through you know in industrial funded efforts and government funded efforts that are at the higher MRL levels. We do that through our fabric innovation ecosystem or fabric innovation network. I mentioned FOA headquarters. We also have work at our fabric discovery centers, of which there are three, one of which is defense, defense focused and is housed at MIT Lincoln Labs. Other two are housed at Drexel University as well as University of Massachusetts Lowell. We also um, have uh, a vast array of government sponsors who have provided $75 million of OSD investment to AFOA for us to engage with our uh, with the ecosystem. And uh, again, part of Project Call 2.0 is part of that, as well as uh, faculty and universities across the country. And our main, most importantly, our manufacturing network, our network of manufacturers who can work with us to robustly in, uh, take new technologies and improve their processes and make them available for end products down the road. Our textile innovation network, our fabric innovation network spans the entire country, as you can see, not in every state, but across east to west with a broad coalition of members uh, across the country. Just to give you a sense of what types of, of members we have, we have members spanning from traditional textile members to consumer facing brands, brands that you've heard of, um, and, and some brands that you, that you may not have heard of, some that are startups and some that are large uh, multinationals. We also have um, advanced materials uh, companies, our, of course, our academic partners, we, as I mentioned, we bridge the gap between textiles and microelectronics. So we have microelectronics companies like Impinge and, and analog devices, as well as system integrators like um, and um, equipment manufacturers. And so you can see we can take this industry and all these partners and bring them together to do active teaming. And that's an important aspect of Project Call 2.0 where when you're looking for a particular, uh, to bring a particular technology from the um, early manufacturing stages all the way through manufacturing level uh, seven, you really need to, to partner with manufacturers who can produce those uh, innovations on industrial scale equipment and, and in production environments. So th that's really at the heart of some of these innovations. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, project success, and so I'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about Project Call 1.0. Although I'll leave our our first project, uh, the New Fabrics project, to Jordan to talk about. But I wanted to point out that of all of these successful projects, whether they were developing sensing textiles for civil infrastructure, or color changing fabrics, or textile interfaces, all of these were innovative uh, ideas with uh, either startup companies or academic or academic uh, researchers paired with innovative manufacturers manufacturers who are willing to take early technology and bring it through their their technology process and so i wanted to point that out because as you join as startups looking at project call 2.5 this is an important aspect of what afoa can help with just active teaming with our manufacturing network to provide you a, a capability to scale that new technology uh, into something that can be made into products much more rapidly just just as an idea of some of the capabilities that we have in-house uh, or not in-house i should say through our network whether that's uh, capabilities through conductive yarns and fabrics or carbon nanotubes or protective fabrics um, or even climate control and textile sensors. These are just a number of technologies and capabilities that we have that if you're seeking pairing for these types of things, we do have companies come to us all the time and say, who do you have that does X, Y, and Z. And that's a, that's a matchmaking opportunity that we have both on the technology level and then also, as I mentioned before, on the manufacturing level. So 
FOA has a technology roadmap in a number of technology areas that we have pursued over time. And in fact, uh, in the process of, of uh, updating our technology roadmap, but for now you can see there are a number of technologies all listed here with the green checks where demonstration above MRL4, to, uh, MRL4 has happened. And we're continuing to work on, on these innovations uh, as we go along, including, uh, you know, working working towards some of these at, for Project Call 2.0. So for Project Call 2.0, I just want to point out that proposers are really encouraged to develop, um, to have a consultation ahead of time. Jess and I are actually doing a lot of those consultations, as are a couple of other members uh, at AFOA. And we're happy to um, have you fill out a, a form to have these consultation requests directly on our website or on the member portal if you're already members. And for information also regarding a FOA membership, please contact us at info at afoa.org. Look like there were a few questions that came up. So I'm going to stop sharing and then go to the Q&A. Yeah, so Michelle, um, maybe what we'll do is we'll actually hold off all the questions kind of to the end. How about okay. that? And then we'll we'll collect them. I'll, I'll, I'll organize them, everything on my end and, and so we can direct them out to the right people. Sound good? That sounds great. All right, perfect. All right, uh, thanks Michelle for the overview of AFOA. Um, all right, next up we've ha we have Jeff Bukuska, uh, who is Program Manager for Future Technology Integration at DEFCOM. Um, and he'll be uh, sharing, obviously, there's a dual purpose application space within the technologies that we're looking for for this uh, project called 2.5. Jeff will speak to the military side of things. So go ahead, Jeff. All right, great. Hold on a second. I am also going to share my screen. Um, so I have a whole bunch of colorful slides. Uh, I did edit out the 20 minute movie, though. I didn't think anyone wanted to see that. Uh, you, can, you can put in the link. Or put the link in the chat. All right. Are you seeing my uh, my slides here, Jess? Uh, 100%. All right, Just awesome. go full screen if you want. All right. So, um, as I said, I am the program manager for future technology integration here at U.S. Army DevCom Soldier Center. I'm also the OSD program manager uh, working with AFOA. Um, so what we try to do is bridge the gap between some of these project calls, the Ensign Program Office, uh, Army capabilities needs, and of course, our uh, industrial and commercial and manufacturing partners, uh, without whom we would not be able to get anything into the hands of warfighters. So, you know, thank you all for being part of this. Um, I have a couple of different topics I'm going to talk about today. Uh, in terms of what DOD's focus, or at least Army's focus is uh, for looking at advanced textiles um, and uh, advanced textile manufacturing, which are our two priority areas. So I also wanna kind of temper this slide a little bit where I say textiles meet microelectronics because certainly microelectronics and smart e-textile capabilities are part of what we're looking for but also technologies such as that developed by uh, Jordan's team at New Fabrics is, is extremely important as well. Multifunctional materials that uh, provide us additional capability beyond those found in standard or traditional textile systems. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. So first thing, what does every soldier want? Well, every soldier wants to be uh, either Iron Man, right? So they've got the integrated power and body armor and they fly and they're a superhero or they're predator, they're invisible, right? Everything is total color changing, color matching, um, so on and so forth. And I borrowed these slides from my colleague, Christine Isherwood, uh, who is a great reference for this. But before we actually get into the technology spaces, let's talk. Jeff, about Jeff, really quick, you're still on slide one. Uh, 
can see your screen sharing problems. You might want to stop sharing and start again. All right, hold on. We will uh, reshare. All right, no worries. All right. All right, we're on slide two. Perfect. All right. So now we're on slide three. Now we're back to where I was before. Again, I won't give you the same spiel. I already gave it. Uh, this is where soldiers want to be. Uh, but we are clearly a far cry um, from these capabilities yet. And that's why we rely on calls and working with groups like Ensign and AFOA and our academic and industry partners. Uh, because we can't do this all alone. But before we actually get into the technology spaces and the, the applications, let's talk a little bit about um, how we within the DOD and the Army, we define protection and survivability, right? I'll let you look through this and I'll touch on it briefly, but we call this the survivability onion uh, for obvious reasons, right? You have multiple layers. Um, as in, we want to be protected or provide layers of protection and defense and situational awareness as far away from the human being or away from the vehicle platform as possible. Because obviously, the closer you get to that center of mass, the more critical the outcome is, right? So if there's a bad guy, we don't want to be where the bad guy is. If there is a bad guy and we can't avoid being in that space, we don't want to be seen by the bad guy. If they do see us, we want to make it hard for them to hit us. If, we, uh, if we're going to engage, we want to be able to engage first. And if they're going to shoot something at us, we don't want to be hit. And if we do get hit, we don't want to be injured. And of course, if we, rather than getting injured, we certainly don't want to get killed. Um, so that's where we start looking at areas of protection. And we want things in all of these realms. So the first is don't be there, all right? So increase situational awareness. And there's a lot of talk going on right now about soldier and squad borne sensor systems and data communications and how we talk about relays between the dismounted soldier, airframes, UGVs, uh, uh, UAVs, and other types of mesh systems. And when we're looking at the battlefield of the future, the, the warfighter is not going to just be wearing his standard textiles. He's going to be integrated with power data, with multifunctional materials. We're going to, be, but of course, power is a big bogey. Um, we're also looking at, you know, how do we mount things onto individual soldiers and networks so that we can actually drive, you know, that awareness. We always want to be sensing and looking at those sensor systems at the farthest part of that survivability onion. So again, uh, the better our network is, the better our intelligence, the less likely we are to be where we don't want to be. Next one is don't be seen, right? And this comes back to actually some of the, uh, one of the questions in the chat, and we'll address the question directly afterwards. Um, but there's really two different ways of addressing signature management, right? tactics um, and the actual materials that go into things. So you now everybody thinks, okay, we're gonna hit the invisibility button and I'm gonna become invisible. But as every B grade movie has shown us, even if I'm invisible, you know, I move through a cloud, I step in dust, there's other ways of being detection or of being detected. Um, there are other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that can be seen in. So we are not just looking at visual uh, signature management, but also, um, you know, uh, electromagnetic shielding. We're looking at uh, different parts of radio and comms and electronic signature, um, various other things. And all of those are important. And in, to some extent, they all need to interface with our textile systems, right? Um, you know, if we have a heat offender, something which is going to generate a lot of uh, thermal energy, like power sources, for instance, that tends to be bad. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, thermal sensors or night vision was, you know, something that mostly our soldiers had, nobody else has. But most of you know, you could probably go on Amazon right now and buy one for a relatively decent sensor for $100. So, 
So if I have a heat source, that's a bad thing. Um, so we, we know we can't get rid of it. How do I mask that? All right, don't be acquired. All right, we don't wanna become a visual target. So part of that is signature management. Some of that might have to do with countermeasures and thinking about what kind of optics um, and non-visual signatures, how do we utilize our surroundings? What are other things that soldiers could carry or utilize that can help mask movement, that can help mask um, signature and communications, sound, um, so on and so forth. And you know, how do we side, how do we we signal those alerts uh, and let the soldier know that he has been targeted, um, or let his leadership uh, know that you know there has been uh, he's been acquired um, without giving away other parts of his position. Uh, finally, don't be in the, don't be engaged. So. Again, we've, we've come to the part where, you know, they saw us, we were close. Um, you know, what are the things that we can build into our textile systems that can protect us from, uh, you know, incidental or, uh, or, or non-direct threats, All right? So in this case, we're talking about chemical and biological threats, uh, radiation, toxic industrial chemicals, um, ballistic threats, so that could be bullets, uh, but it could also be, you know, explosions from mines or IEDs, um, vehicle explosions, things like that. Um, bl blast threats, which again would be your IEDs, but it could be indirect blast from, you know, rockets and other things. Um, so it's the challenge here, you know, where we might not be looking at uh, you know, in this case, microelectronics built into our textile, we might be looking at a better blend or, you know, combination of composites and um, ballistic protective materials. And also where would those materials go? There's a lot of system engineering involved. I think the other thing that, you know, even though we have pictures of soldiers on the screen here, there's also elements where we might put these textiles into vehicle systems. More and more as we go for lightweight vehicles and airframes, we're looking at textiles and composites as being portions of those systems. So looking at how we can further develop those technologies and put them into those systems is something we should consider. Um, don't be hit, all right? So um, right now we have 38 pounds of body armor that each individual soldier wears, not counting all of their other equipment. Um, being able to make that lighter, being able to increase the number of hits it can take, or uh, you know, redirecting that energy. You know, as we move into the future, we're not just looking at regular flying hot pieces of metal. We might be looking at um, you know thermal and other types of hazards. Um, so. That's important. And of course, don't be injured. So this is interesting because everybody tends to equate the don't be hit and the don't be injured is the same thing. Uh, but when we start looking at textiles that maybe have integrated um, antibiotics or smart tourniquet systems or you know systems that prevent you from bleeding out if you do get shot, um, things that allow you to you know, reinforce a limb you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting technologies out there which could help to move this along, All right? So I know I'm running short on time. I just wanna to touch super quickly on this. The other thing that DOD is really interested in and where it really ties into the AFOA mission is advanced manufacturing, All right? And why does DOD care about advanced manufacturing? Everybody who's heard me speak has heard me make this point. We need industry to be working with us to develop and scale these technologies because if you don't build them, we can't buy them and put them on our warfighters, all right? Nowhere do I have factories or warehouses full of soldiers, airmen, Marines, sailors, or Coast Guardmen sewing uniforms, welding composites, making, uh, doing arc welding or any other manufacturing process that's scalable, all right? So, if I can't get it out of the lab and I can't get it into manufacturing, 
it does me no good. Uh, and that's where working with the NIMIs, uh, or which Michelle already talked about, is fundamentally important. So there is a lot of investment coming out of DOD to help cross that valley of death, which Michelle had another slide, which again, I'm actually gonna throw up a similar slide to it. And this really should highlight for all of you uh, where we put in a few other things. The DOD makes a huge investment in early research, MRL, MR, TRL one through three, and in acquisition, eight through 10. But the only things that we really have that are working to cross that bridge in terms of getting it out of the labs and out of basic research and into large scale manufacturing are programs like those at Ensign and DIU and the MIIs like AFOA. Um, so uh, DOD recognizes that they are, have made significant investments and will continue to do so in that area. Um, so rather than hog the rest of the time, uh, I will yield the stage to the next speaker. All right, thank you, Jeff. Much appreciated. Thanks for bringing up the uh, the points on the manufacturing and tying that into AFOA. I think that's really a, a very important message for all of the uh, potential um, applications that we're going to be seeing in 2.5 is to make sure that there is going to be a, uh, a manufacturing plan that is aligned up with with some of the interests that we have here uh, at AFOA. So. Um, Last but not least, and then we'll get on to questions afterwards. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, we might try to make this a little bit more informal as well and uh, allow um, some speakers or allow you to uh, ask your question directly. Uh, but we'll see at the end, see how many questions we have. But I'm going to introduce Jordan Schindler, who's the CEO at New Fabrics. Um, and Jordan, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Jess. All right. You guys got the slides and they go full screen here. Good to go. All good. Thanks. And it's it's great to follow Jeff and all the support that those guys are providing because because that truly does make the difference for for what we're doing. So, I mean, ultimately, as as way of introduction, you can imagine um, in the don't be injured, right? You can have a a garment or piece of clothing that would release a blood clotting agent when it, when a soldier gets shot. And there's a wide variety of things that you can put in garments to ultimately create a better use case for. Uh, our men and women in uniform. So our company is all about simplifying health and wellness. And it's this idea that instead of having to take a pill or use a cream or a patch, what if you could just get dressed in the morning? And our core technology enables controlled delivery of vitamins, supplements, medications through your clothing. And that remains effective through 25 plus wash cycles. So it might be a line of topical analgesics, an icy hot or biofreeze in a uniform, in a sock, in a knee sleeve. It might be melatonin in a pillowcase to help you fall asleep at night, or it may, might be a face mask with a moisturizer for your skin. And so we are creating this category that we call healthware. So instead of simply going to the store and buying a garment based on color or size or brand, it's now what health benefit do you want to achieve from your garment? And so for us, company started uh, 2014. And as we were scaling along the process, um, we realized we needed capital to actually grow and build the business. And it's, it's that's where folks like AFOA, uh, like some of these DOD partnerships, allowed us to really scale and grow the ecosystem. So all of our products are made here domestically in the United States. Um, and we actually manufacture in FDA clean rooms. So because we are a drug delivery product, we actually have to have that same level of rigor through a garment. So a, a good way to think of us is as a drug delivery platform that's utilizing textiles as that more convenient platform for delivery. One of the biggest challenges in modern medicine is patient compliance. I'm as guilty of it as anyone. We start we stop taking our antibiotics the second we feel better, forget to rub creams or take pills as we're supposed to. Uh, from personal experience, my, my grandpa unfortunately suffered from Alzheimer's for a number of years and he could never remember to take his medications. But interestingly, he still put on a sock every single morning. Clothing is the most intimate human interface. It contacts our skin all day, every day. 
it's a perfect platform for solving health and wellness goals. So in tandem with our relationship with, with Afoa, we were able to launch Nationwide at Walmart last year. Uh, so we're in 4,400 Walmart locations. And then sitting down with the buyer in two minutes, he goes, I get it. That there's this huge correlation between people buying braces and pain creams. Why not just put the two things together? And so you think about applications for uh, soldiers and military. Um, soldiers are already hiking 40 or 50 miles a day with heavy backpacks on. They certainly don't want to carry extra weight or extra medicine. And they're definitely not going to stop in the middle of a battlefield and rub a cream on their foot. And so if there's a pain relief agent built into a uniform, a stimulant to keep soldiers awake, or melatonin to help soldiers sleep better, uh, there's a lot of inherent interest there and in products that make a lot of sense. So as we continue to, to grow and scale, this is a, a platform technology. So we can put in a wide variety of different active ingredients into garments. So because we all failed science class, we decided to, to recreate our own periodic table of elements here. Um, but you can see some of the different active ingredients and the use cases that we're able to create. So it might be a, a pain relief solution or bruising or wound healing or anti-inflammatory. We're also launching maternity for stretch marks. And so there's a wide variety of ultimate end garments or applications here that we're able to create. And, and next time you're in your CVS or Walgreens or local pharmacy, there's this whole category of products just in pain relief. So it's your knee sleeves, arm sleeves, kinesiology tape, finger splints, band-aids, you name it. It's all for pain relief, but yet none of it actually has a pain reliever in it. And that's just one category of products that we're able to go after. And so hopefully this gives you a sense of, of where we're headed. And you can see some of our different product lines. Again, we, we focus first just on pain relief and these all have a, a capstacin or a topical analgesic built into it. And they last for 25 plus wash cycles. And you can see some, some quick expansion in retail numbers, but we're continuing to grow and, and build the category. And as you think about our positioning in the market just in retail, we are next to the braces, we're next to the pain creams, and there's a massive market opportunity here. Clothing is a viable opportunity for a lot of different industries, not just in apparel, right? While we are creating a textile product, we're actually a drug delivery solution. So the people buying our products are actually those that are now not buying topical analgesics, like Icy Hot or BioFreeze or like anti-inflammatory. It's a more convenient way for solving ailments. And so for us, We've been extremely fortunate to continue to grow and scale based on the traction we've gotten from this network and partners. And it's led to uh, a number of different retail locations. So this year we'll be expanding into CVS, uh, into Target, into Walgreens, into GNC. And again, that's based on our development and our ability to support hundreds of thousands of units. And, and that doesn't happen overnight. You need to have that manufacturing network here in North Carolina in order to do that and to scale. So we've been, we've been fortunate that uh, the project called 1.0 was, was such a success and connected us with the right partners in DOD, with the right partners in, uh, I would say, retail and apparel and manufacturing. And that's ultimately what's allowed us to scale and, and grow and build the business. And just a, a sneak peek where we're, where we're headed in, in maternity uh, on, the, on the stretch mark side, but a, a number of different product categories and opportunities that we're able to go after. And I would, I would encourage the group on this call to, to focus on the ecosystem that OFOA brings um, because it, it really is contacts, networks, manufacturing supply chain. That's ultimately what makes this go. We moved out to uh, the East Coast to be in the heart of textile manufacturing because our business isn't successful anywhere else. You have to have those relationships. You have to have the know-how. And you have to obviously have the, the funding helps as well, but it, it really is that whole interconnected ecosystem. And uh, we're, we're fortunate to be a part of, of this network and happy to answer any questions if you guys got them. So thanks. All right. Thanks, Jordan. I uh, appreciate um, you, uh, Michelle and Jeff for all kind of giving your uh, perspective on the opportunities that are presented within this project call and working with the FOA. Um, all right. So we, we do have a couple questions within the chat right now. Um, and uh, Michelle, uh, you and I might take the first one here, uh, and that is define traction for startups in the Project Call 2.5. Um, and so I'll, I'll let you give your perspective first, if you don't mind, and then I'll, I'll chime in with a few other things. 
Sorry, you did tell me mute myself. <laughs> so absolutely, I'd say, first of all, we'd like to see some uh, customer interest. Now, whether that's customer interest from the DOD or that's customer interest from industrial partners, we'd like to see that, that there is sort of support and interest from the industry. Jess, maybe you can add on to that as well. Yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, we're, we're looking, as the Project Call 2.5 is uh, defined, we're looking for technologies that are in that TRL, uh, which technology readiness level or manufacturing readiness level um, of at least uh, two to three, um, preferably a little bit higher. I mean, the whole goal of this is to help uh, our sweet spot in terms of helping you out is between uh, manufacturing readiness levels four and seven. Uh, so if you, you know, evidence of traction up to that point is more than just a benchtop uh, demonstration, uh, but it's also some of that validation, as uh, Michelle was saying. Um, I think that there needs to, uh, you know, for that to be proven out, I think there needs to be some cost estimations uh, associated with whatever product that you're trying to develop, um, as as well as uh, who is, what needs and what, what um, I guess, target market you're, uh, provi or you're providing a solution for, as well as the size of that target market. Um, so I think that that's, I think that kind of covers it pretty well. All right. Um, let's see, uh, Jeff, uh, there's a, there's a question about the, uh, um, current critical military applications, uh, specifically with use cases for color change besides camouflage. And I just wonder if you wanted to address that a little bit more. Um, sure. So obviously with, uh, color change fabrics, um, you know, visual camouflage is going to be the, uh, the, the primary thrust. Um, however, um, I think we could, again, break that out into various platforms, right? So color change textiles and what could be uniforms, it could be equipment, but it could also be for the composites that go into, again, the vehicles, or it could be um, screens or tarps or shelter systems. Um, the other thing that we might want to think about with color changes potentially not even in the, the realm of camouflage at all, but also it could be used for say identification, where maybe we have you, you know, to put it in a, you know, an operational context, you may have units going out that are, you know, interacting with different local forces or other, you know, friendly military forces where we want to be able to either change their designation, uh, adjust our own designation, put symbols out there, depending on what country you're in, um, or potentially you have some kind of a sensor that goes, that monitors your health and you have, you know, a symbol that appears based off of some kind of a blast or other event, right? So, I mean, there, there's a lot of realm there. Um, another interesting thing for, uh, for color change would be uh, just simple things. Well, I say simple, but of course the technology is hard. Um, so if we look at sensors for, again, blast or chem bio detection, where, you know, we're looking at, for lack of a better term, a red green sensor, where if you are, if a warfighter or a vehicle encounters, say, a chemical hazard, and uh, there's some kind of detection system and, you know, a certain textile segment turns red a simple visual cue that lets them know that they have been contaminated or that a vehicle has encountered something. Because again, we're, we're looking at standoff. You know, the other idea might be if you can build it into the composite system that you're more likely to, you know, use a, uh, an aerial vehicle or a ground vehicle as a scout platform. So having those change colors if they're contaminated. Um, being able to have colors change as a result of um, pressure or blast also would be important uh, so that we can actually detect what kind of an incident has occurred. Uh, but those would be the, the primary purposes, I think, for, for color change. And I think we went over a bunch of other military applications for textiles. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there, while we're on the topic of, of uh, applications, um, one of the question is, one of the questions that was 
provide us our rehabilitative applications of interest to this project call? Um, I would say most definitely yes. Uh, I think that that's a very interesting target market. Uh, Michelle, I'll, I'll push it over to you for a little bit more information. Well, I would say that while we're, we're at a, um, looking for dual use in the case of rehabilitation, we obviously have those types of needs in the military as well. And so I think that, um, it's certainly through the VA health system and other capabilities, there's, there's scope for that. Joey's nodding his head yes. Maybe he wants to uh, make a comment about that. <laughs> All right. Jeff, do you, have a, do you have anything that you want to add to, to that particular application space? Um, I guess it depends on what we're talking about with regards to rehabilitation. I'd like a little bit more clarity out of that. Are we talking about like, you know, musculoskeletal? Are we talking about, you know, substance? Are you talking about cognitive? Uh, there, there are a lot of different applications there. So, uh, and there's a need space in each and every one of those. You know, I think Jordan teed it up really well with his discussion earlier about where textiles potentially live in pain relief. You know, if we, we look at that exact space, then absolutely there's a need but there's also needs in all of the other areas as well. So um, I, I think it should definitely be part of it. I think I, I'd love to see some creative ideas on it. Okay, cool. All right, um, let's see. We do have a few more questions. Uh, a few things about the, uh, how collaborations are structured. Um, I'm assuming that you're, you're thinking about in terms of uh, how you might be writing the proposal uh, and what sort of activities that you might be able to be doing with a FOA. Um, and then are, the, are, are they milestone-based? What is a typical uh, timeline for these collaborations? Who typically owns the resulting technology and who would typically profit from the uh, future commercial endeavors? Uh, so I'll go ahead and start tackling a little bit about that. And then I will, um, I'll, I'll hand it back, I'll hand it over to Michelle to, to answer a few things that I might have missed. Uh, so first of all, um, the collaborate, the, the, it is, it should be a milestone based proposal. Um, there are, uh, um, there are quarterly reports or quarterly updates that you'd be providing to a foe and a foe leadership, as well as our member community. Uh, some of that would be non-confidential, especially if it's to the member community. Um, and then, then at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh period of performance, there is going to be a, uh, demonstration day that is going to be as part of a, a, a FOA member event uh, that will happen in around that quarter four of that, uh, again, of that period of performance. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is gearing towards manufacturing. So the milestones that you put out there uh, should be dependent on your particular technology and your particular technology's development. Uh, so, uh, but we are requiring at that demonstration event to have not only a performance report uh, and, a, and a manufacturing feasibility report, but also uh, three iteration or three uh, version, three um, uh, copies of your technology that you've, that you've uh, developed. Um, Michelle. Sure. So I wasn't sure actually, because the collaborations were called out in the question, whether these were um, whether the question was actually directed at just the projects themselves or also the collaborations between the team members. So I'll just talk a little bit about collaborations between team members, uh, just in case that was what was of interest. So in the case of these collaborations, we mentioned teaming. So some teams might come on board already. You may know of a manufacturer that you want to work with and you, you make a proposal and you both have already um, decided to work together, but there may be capabilities that you bring to bear, but you're looking for a manufacturer to work with to help you bring that uh, technology uh, through, the, through the valley of death, so to speak. And in that case, that's where these pre-consultations come in or even uh, potentially between the um, initial submittal, which is uh, now due June 13th, to, to, the, um, to, the, to the full proposal where a FOA can come in and say, oh, you're looking for knitting, knitting capability with X, Y, and Z type of, uh, type of products. 
okay, here are our manufacturing members who might be of interest for that. And with respect to the IP, this is something that we expect the, the teams to negotiate themselves. In fact, hopefully ahead of the um, full proposal submission where the manufacturer and the um, the technology innovator would get together and talk talk through those types of details. That is something a FOA would not necessarily uh, engage in. It's something that the team would negotiate amongst themselves. Now, with respect to government funding um, through a FOA, that this there does come government purpose rights. So that's over and above the, any of the agreements that you make yourselves. But the IP remains with the inventors. So I hope that answers your question. And if not, we can, you can type in a follow-up. All right, perfect. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I guess sort of along that same lines of the collaborations and the teaming, um, Chris asks in the, uh, the Q&A, what role can uh, small uh, manufacturers under 10 employees use laser cutting technology play in bridging the manufacturing gap? Well, so if we have some, this is a really great example. If we have somebody come to us and say, I have this new capability and it requires laser cutting, that's something that we'd like to hear about from the, uh, you know, a FOA perspective so that we can then consider you for future teaming. So if you're an AFOA member, now this is something we do just with members at the moment. Um, if you're an AFOA member, we would say, oh, okay, it's um, Chris's company. Not sure what that is, but <laughs> that's the company that you want to work with. And we make those matches. Now, we don't make anything, any, any of these matches or requirements. Uh, those matches are, are really up to the individual proposers to explore amongst themselves once we make the recommendation in the matchmaking. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we're actually, we're keeping a pretty good list of companies uh, that are either providing the proposals um, and some of the technologies that they need, as well as companies that aren't submitting proposals, but are willing to be a, uh, a partner with other companies. So uh, we are keeping that in mind and um, looking forward to helping out with some of the teaming. Okay. Um, let's see, there was a, there was another question about the uh, pitch event itself. Uh, and I'll go ahead and take care of that. So, uh, so pitch event details, um, uh, specifically the length uh, is a virtual and then who's going to be in the audience. Uh, so the length of the event, so remember it's uh, July 29th. Uh, usually it goes from about 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the day. We're actually in the process of scheduling that right now. Um, and we are going to have uh, in the afternoon, there will be a series of, uh, of the company pitches. Uh, or the project pitches, uh, that'll be about 15 minutes a piece. That includes a couple minutes for Q&A at the back end of that. Um, and then the rest of the time, we're going to be filling out with different panel sessions, as well as uh, targeted speakers on new technology developments within the military textiles, as well as smart textiles. Um, so we typically have, we typically, our Ensign typically uh, has about 100 plus attendees. Um, and the uh, and uh, more information on the specifics to that will actually be uh, needed or will be provided in the uh, um, for those that are selected to move forward with the full proposal. All right. So I just heard that there are more questions in the Q and A, which I was only looking at. Oh, we do have Q and A questions. How about that? All right. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate that. I was just looking at the chat feature. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, Joey, before we get going on that, do you want to um, provide any more details about who uh, uh, Ensign's inviting to the uh, to the starts event? Yeah, happy to, Jesse. I know you're on a roll too, so I won't take you. I won't keep you too long. So, um, uh, you know, as Jesse mentioned. Uh, as we get further into the proposal process, we kind of determine who those teams are. We'll provide more information, but uh, we're going to be looking at a wide swath of uh, attendees. So Ensign, as we talked about with uh, dual, dual use purpose uh, companies and early stage ventures, we want to attract not only those in the DOD who have an interest in this same topic, but those in the private sector as far as investors and as far as um, other stakeholders who would be interested. So venture capital is always a partner that we want to be involved. Um, anyone else um, of that nature who, uh, who has a record of supporting this type of technology innovation uh, would be in the audience too. So 
Uh, we look forward to having uh, this wide berth and uh, we look forward to finding out how we could create that organic uh, collaboration that uh, we're trying to replicate in a, in a virtual environment. All right, thanks, Joey. Um, okay, so uh, uh, in the Q&A, Donald asks, uh, will a copy of the deck be provided to the attendees? I think that the recording and the deck uh, can certainly be provided um, along with, with permission from Jeff and Jordan, of course. Um, uh, Donald also asks, uh, wonderful to hear about the extensive ecosystem. Uh, and he's wanting to know a little bit more specifically where and how a small science and engineering startup might enter the picture. Uh, which I think it, we kind of covered within the teaming event or the, the teaming process and the collaborations with that. So uh, let us know you're out there, uh, which I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, and we can definitely figure out ways in which we might be able to team you up with some, uh, with some of our other member company or with some member companies uh, or other companies that may be thinking about applying. Uh, Donald also asks, I understand that the focus of this particular session is defense oriented. Our interest is, however, is to engage AFOA to uh, productively assist us in commercializing our advanced technology, our textile technology by partnering, licensing, or selling our intellectual property that has a large retail oriented sales potential in the industrial fabric space. Michelle, that's a mouthful, but go for it. Well, so this, this not only is this a uh, project call uh, or discussion uh, national security based, but also it's project call 2.0 based. So let's separate project call 2.0 versus potentially additional technologies you may have that may or may not apply to project call 2.0. So, so if there's something that you can think of that, um, that, that you would like to engage on for funding for project call 2.0, we'd certainly love for you to have a consultation event and we can understand that more and, and determine if there's a fit with that, with that. If this is not project call 2.0 related, certainly you can reach out at info at or, uh, you know, set up a meeting with, with us in particular, and we can talk about that further to say, okay, well, we have plenty of other opportunities, whether they're project calls or their other needs um, across the ecosystem that we're, we're pushing forward. So I, I think it would be worthwhile have a discussion and we're certainly open for that. All right, cool. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Jeff, uh, you have the last uh, couple questions here uh, about some of the um, topics that you had mentioned, uh, specifically within synthetic muscles, um, as well as um, the area of ballistics. And hopefully our... Um, uh, Greg was wanting to know a little bit more about the technology gaps or challenges that might be faced within each one of those. Right. Well, um, I'll do my best. As, as some of my colleagues on the line here are aware, I am not the technical expert in these areas. So I can talk to you about operational needs. Uh, when we're talking about synthetic actuators or synthetic muscles, uh, the primary purpose for that is going to be in soft or semi-rigid exoskeletons. Um, so not Iron Man and not even uh, Ripley's load lifting system in Aliens, uh, but something that could be incorporated into a textile system, which is going to provide some measure of energy recovery, um, injury prevention, um, load support, um, or musculoskeletal reinforcement, right? So we're thinking uh, ankles, knees, hips, pelvis, spine, neck, uh, primarily. Um, but, you know, we'd also be looking at, at arms and elbows too. So any of your, your, your limbs, but really that's what we're looking for is at least initially energy recovery, injury prevention. Um, and, you know, we understand that that powered is probably where a lot of these systems are going, but you know, being as minimally powered as possible, or having a uh, you know having this coupled to some kind of power generation capability, which helps to zero out the power budget, is desirable. Um, so, in terms of what the actual metrics they're looking for for energy recovery, that's a a more in-depth discussion and, you know, we can follow on with some additional information on that. Uh, areas or, or challenges in ballistics. So, you know, ballistics are always chicken and egg problems, right? So, 
you know, we build, we put more armor on and, you know, they, they invent a more powerful bullet or better penetrating round, right? Actually, you know, the, the joke we have when we're talking about ballistics protection is that this is the same discussion that they've been having for the past, you know, 4,000 years, right? You have a, yeah, we, we, we had leather and then we built better swords that could cut through the leather. So we put chain mail in place and now there's hammers that crush the chain mail. So we put plates, so now we, right? So, and that's where we are today. Except as I said and mentioned earlier, what we have now is 24 layers of soft Kevlar, which do some blast and ballistics protection, but then when we couple it with 38 pounds of ceramic plates on the front and on the back, well, you know that's a that's a lot of weight and encumbrance when it comes to to stopping bullets um, and when the average weight of the dismounted infantrymen uh, is about 160 pounds that is a huge to weight to uh, maneuverability disadvantage so when we're looking at ballistics i mean the the answers there are pretty easy make it lighter make it um, stronger make it more redirectional in terms of blast, make it easier to uh, manufacture and stop a, a larger threat. So as we start looking at next generation munitions, when we're looking at fragmentation and spall, uh, all of those are areas that we're challenged with. Now, not every textile solution or not every solution that we care about is going to be the big explosions either. You know, there are a significant, or what we see in the past 20 years is that there's been a significant number of debilitating injuries, which have taken place from secondary explosions or from, you know, a term we call spall, which is uh, something blows up and you have dirt, debris, small pebbles, pieces of, you know, microscopic sized metal that rips into and tears things. So being able to stop that using lightweight, durable materials uh, is would be a, a significant game changer. Um, and when you look at what the current ballistic materials are, while they are, you know, phenomenal, uh, there are trade-offs there in terms of durability, in terms of environmental uh, degradation, in terms of uh, being able to have them match with. Uh, you know, our, our visual and other signature management applications. So, so there, there isn't one answer. It's all part of that onion and how we put those pieces together. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, you don't give yourself enough credit. You sound pretty technically adept to me. I have smart people that talk at me a lot. All right, well, that's true. I, I can't <laughs> disagree with that. All right. Um, all right, well, I don't see any additional questions. Um, so Joey, I'm gonna hand it back over to you, but before I do, I just want to let you know that please, I, I really do encourage uh, you to reach out for a consultation, it's not too late. Uh, remember the pre-proposal is only three pages long and it's a draft budget, so it's not uh, the fully completed budget. So you have plenty of time to submit uh, your ideas and we just wanna kind of get you in the, in the system and in the books for, uh, so that we can uh, proceed on with some of the teaming efforts on our side. Uh, but I posted the link in, for Project Call 2.0 um, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the chat. Joey, I'll let you take it away or end it up. Yeah, thank you very much, Jesse, Michelle, Jeff, uh, Jordan, everyone. Thank you for joining us and um, looking forward to collaborating in the future on our uh, pitch day at the end of July, July 29th. And so please take advantage of the resources that Jesse has offered. I've included my name and email address in the chat and uh, we look forward to posting this video. Also, when we get the approval for the slides on the Ensign page and we'll post those also um, through our social media. So please check out ensign.us or uh, look us up on LinkedIn for those uh, links coming up in the future. So thank you all very much and have a wonderful day. All right, thanks Joe. Thank you everyone. Yeah.